Thank you for joining me today. My name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of viral hepatitis. Our learning objectives today include number one, for you to be able to name the pathogens that cause viral hepatitis. Number two, for you to be able to identify some of the clinical signs and symptoms of acute and chronic viral hepatitis. And finally, number three, to be able to recognize some of the liver enzyme changes associated with viral hepatitis infection. As already mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about the viral causes of hepatitis, and in particular, the hepatitis viruses, which are highlighted here and can be recognized by their association with a letter, such as hepatitis A, B, C, etc. Most simply put, the term hepatitis means inflammation of the liver, and there are many different causes of hepatitis, toxins including alcohol, prescription and over-the-counter medication overdoses, autoimmune conditions, lack of sufficient blood supply to the liver, such as in a state of shock, and also infectious etiologies. These are all potential causes of hepatitis. The hepatitis viruses are a group of unrelated viruses that have been somewhat lumped together in name due to their similar effects on the liver. I'm going to talk to you briefly about how acute and chronic hepatitis infections can manifest in your patients. These clinical presentations may vary slightly by the type of virus, but they do share some similarities. I will go over these viruses individually in upcoming modules, but just to give you a broad overview, you can see some of the similarities and differences between the hepatitis viruses here. Most of the viruses have a single-stranded RNA genome, except for hepatitis B, which is made of double-stranded DNA. The hepatitis viruses that are transmitted through the blood, which are hepatitis B, C, and D, are the same ones that can set up a chronic carrier state inside of an infected host. We have vaccinations against some of the viral hepatitises, but unfortunately, not all. When a patient becomes infected with one of the hepatitis viruses, a number of symptoms may occur. First and foremost, there may be no symptoms at all, which is why a large number of people infected with hepatitis viruses do not know that they are infected. When patients do have symptoms of hepatitis infection, they may present as a very nonspecific flu-like illness with fever, headache, body aches, fatigue, anorexia, and sometimes nausea and vomiting. Some patients will have abdominal pain, often in the right upper quadrant that is related to liver swelling. On exam, some patients may have yellowing of the eyes and skin known as jaundice. This finding is related to elevated levels of bilirubin released from damaged biliary cells and due to the injured liver's inability to process bilirubin effectively. You may be able to detect a swollen liver on exam, and the area may be somewhat tender to palpation. If labs are obtained, they will typically show several abnormalities in the patient's liver function tests. Aspartate aminotransferase, also known as AST, and alanine aminotransferase, or ALT, are enzymes that reside inside hepatocytes and are released when viral infection and inflammatory responses lead to liver cell death. The levels of AST and ALT can be very elevated in the early stages of viral hepatitis infection, often to greater than 1,000, where normal is in the 20s to 40s range. Other liver enzymes reside within cells of the biliary tree, such as gamma glutamyl transferase, also known as GGT, and alkaline phosphatase, or ALKFOS for short. These are two such enzymes. These enzyme levels are typically normal or near normal during the early stages of viral infection. As viral infection and inflammation continues, liver swelling can cause obstruction of the biliary tree, which prevents bile from leaving the liver. The rise in unprocessed bilirubin in the bloodstream leads to jaundice, which is that yellowing of the skin that I mentioned before. In addition to rising bilirubin, 
Labs may also reveal elevated levels of ALKFOS and GGT from the damaged bile duct cells. Finally, it is important to remember that hepatocytes are involved in the regulation and storage of various biochemicals, including vitamins and minerals. The liver is also responsible for the synthesis and metabolic regulation of many substances in the body. For example, the liver synthesizes cholesterol and most blood proteins, such as albumin and clotting factors. The liver also plays an important role in hormonal modification and inactivation. Therefore, when the liver is damaged, coagulopathies and hormone dysregulation can result. Toxic substances such as ammonia and the byproducts of medications that are cleared by the liver can also begin to accumulate, which can cause a number of bad side effects. We already mentioned that there are various non-infectious causes of hepatitis. So how do we diagnose viral hepatitis in particular? We can check to see if a patient has antibodies against the hepatitis virus in question. However, it can sometimes take our bodies many weeks to generate virus-specific antibodies, sometimes even months. Therefore, if you are evaluating a person who is acutely ill from hepatitis and you suspect a virus, sending a blood test for viral PCR can be a more definitive way to find the virus in question. It's important to know that while the hepatitis viruses specifically target the liver, there are also many other viruses, such as the herpes viruses shown here, that can cause liver damage as one aspect of their clinical presentation. We won't get into all of these viruses today, but viral serologies and PCR can also help you to detect these important causes of hepatitis. The treatment of acute viral hepatitis is usually supportive care, which may involve an intensive care unit stay and even liver transplantation for very severe cases. If and when patients recover, it is important to vaccinate them against the other causes of viral hepatitis to help prevent a second hit from viral hepatitis in the future. Currently, we only have vaccines against hepatitis A and B. There are some medications that can be used against the hepatitis viruses, but we will discuss these in greater detail in future modules. It's important to know that while all hepatitis viruses have the potential to be cleared from our body via the immune system, some of the hepatitis viruses are well known for their ability to cause a chronic carrier state in a large number of people that they infect. As such, a considerable segment of the world's population are in chronic carriers of the hepatitis viruses. But as I mentioned before, many people do not realize that they are infected. The long-term sequelae of chronic viral hepatitis infection may include cirrhosis, which is a permanent damage to the liver, immune complex disease, and also hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a type of liver cancer. Chronic viral hepatitis is most often totally asymptomatic in its earlier stages, and it can take decades for symptoms to appear. Lab tests may show normal or at least near normal liver function tests. The risks of progressing to cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, or other complications is related to a number of different factors, including the type of viral hepatitis and the individual patient's medical comorbidities. For example, a patient who is infected with both viral hepatitis and HIV, or a patient who's infected with both viral hepatitis and is also a heavy drinker, has a significantly higher risk of progressing to cirrhosis, and they may progress at a faster rate. Thank you so much for your time and attention. These are some of my image references.